Open Source has been at the center of innovation for quite some time and it continues to be very important in the discussions that we're having now with the emergence of new technologies such as generative AI. I'm Alex Williams, founder and publisher of the New Stack, and I'm here today with Adam Seldman, Vice President of Developer Experience at Amazon Web Services. Great to see you, Adam. Hey, good to see you, Alex. Good to see you. You know, and I'm here because of PyTorch, and PyTorch is pretty interesting right now, and I've been, you know, reading up about it, and, and we we come across it all the time with the New Stack. And that really kind of stems from the, the popularity of the Python programming language, which has just ballooned in popularity over the past several years. So thinking you know, about that experience that you're finding that developers are thinking through when they're using these more sophisticated technologies. And it's a very confusing time. We talked a little bit about this beforehand. And so how do you think about PyTorch in that context? Yeah, uh, well, PyTorch is super exciting. It's enabled you know, with the, the su support of Meta and a broader community, just some kind of amazing like model innovation and AI innovation and research innovation. So. We're super excited to be, you know, um, contributors to PyTorch, contributors to the PyTorch to Foundation level, and uh, uh, just make sure that data scientists and ML researchers and developers have this amazing library they go work with and innovate and and uh, build new models and explore this kind of new world of generative AI. Yeah, and, and open source is a big part of this story, you know, and you know, if you think about open source and how it's developed over the past 10, 15 years, it's just ballooned again in popularity you know and if you look at kind of the original you know the original open source technology was meant to fix things right we really saw that emerge in back in the 90s where you need to fix the software more effectively so open source emerged out of that in the past 10 20 years we've seen the emergence more of like cloud native technologies right and the ability then to really you know pull all these different pieces together but I remember looking at enterprise software back when you know we first met, and it was awful, right? It was awful. What has open source done to yeah. enterprise software? Well, uh, open source has been amazing. It's been amazing for my career. Like I've been yeah. working on open source since the '90s, and in, yeah. uh, in uh, graduate school, got you know Linux desktop was like my day to day daily yeah. driver yeah. machine. So. Yeah. Um, um, it's so it's been it's pretty been formative in my career, and I think it's been foundational to sort of the growth of AWS and innovation. At AWS, yeah. AWS has used open source since the early days, contributed to open source, yeah. um, involves really big projects now like OpenSearch yeah. and Valky and others, and PyTorch as a, as a contributor. Um, and I just I just think what's happened is it's it's let creative technical people bring their best ideas to life. And it's done a really delightful way where there's both technical innovation and there's a lot of like human knowledge sharing and best practices. You know, these communities are bigger than just the code it, itself. I think we see that with the PyTorch conference this week. So um, I think AWS has uh, really benefited and the whole world has benefited from open source. And uh, I think we're going to see even more innovation in this like generative AI world now that open source is such a big part of that also. Yeah, the generative AI world is actually you know, almost seems like how it's put us into leapfrog mode, you know, right? And so now we're talking about, we talked about LLMs. Now we're talking about how do you use agents? And if you're going to use agents, you need to think about, you know, augmentation, you know, plus then you think about these traditional applications such as CRM technologies or whatever they might be. So you have CRM, CRM technologies, for instance, we have Dreamforce this week. You know, we have uh, we have these these agents, and we have that have all the data. The experience in this has to be a consideration, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, well, we want you know my perspective and what AWS wants is we want developers to, be able to pick and choose and pick the frameworks and libraries and tooling they want to build really awesome, innovative things. But at the same time, also deliver the things that like their company is going to want and their customers are going to want to keep data safe. You know, they're going to want to lock down access to corporate data. They're not going to want it to leak off to, you know, uh, model train other companies' models or right. something. They're going to want the agent agentic systems they build for their customers to have guardrails. So we do things like yes. bedrock guardrails. So I, I think it's a really natural fit. You know, the open source innovative innovation and frameworks and libraries. And then when you go to production, you 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 pull in some of those guardrails 
and do infrastructure like IM and security, you know, from your cloud provider like AWS, so that you can deliver a really great, secure, and trusted, you know, experience out to your end users or end customers. So I think those two things can go together. I don't think they're conflict that open source innovation to really build really neat new generative AI applications, but then also keep them locked down and secure so that your end users can really trust them and your data is safe and, 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 the, and the output is responsible. That's a security matter that I heard a lot at to the cloud native security conference that the Linux Foundation did in the beginning of the summer where we have now so many API endpoints, you know, and LLMs now being used in applications and there's a data you know, you got to be very careful about the data, right? And so this becomes then an experience yeah. issue, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, I think I saw a joke that somebody said, if you can't find an API key for a public service <laughs> you want to use, you sort of like type it into your chat tool of choice and just complete with one random one that it was trained on. So that's not how we want the world to go. We don't want to just use API keys. We don't want API <laughs> keys like leaked willy nilly. And so we want to really help our developer community just like build things with defense in depth and, and modern approach to security. So how does that relate to open source then? Um, well, like open source is part of it. Like you build, you have your open source libraries, your frameworks, your utilities, your tooling, but then you also want to go to production. And so you're going to run your open source somewhere. So we want AWS to be a really great place to run open source. You might manage it on your own. You might get a managed service from us or from one of our partners, but just be able to build on that like reliable cloud infrastructure platform, the AWS, the security and the ops and the like global footprint that you expect, but then deliver a really great innovative open source capability out to your users or as part of your application. So infrastructure and open source, AWS infrastructure and open source go really well together. AWS infrastructure and open source go very well together. And so maybe you could help us then provide context about PyTorch then and how you participate in foundations through AWS and your open source team there. Yeah. Um, PyTorch is one of many open source projects that we contribute to. Uh, we have on the order of 20 engineers that contribute code to PyTorch. Uh, we use PyTorch as we build our own uh, models here, our generative AI models inside AWS and Amazon. And uh, many of our customers use PyTorch on top of AWS. We make it work with SageMaker and uh, we're an active contributor of uh, infrastructure services so the PyTorch community can build and innovate and have a great, because you know, it costs money to, to do all the builds they do at the rate of innovation that PyTorch has. So that's a contribution we make to the community. How does the generative AI you know, capability, and not just generative AI, but AI is used in machine learning quite a bit. I mean, how is it affecting you know, the different practices that software engineers are part of inside their organization, such as just developing the application, deploy, you know, deploying the applications and managing the applications. I think generative AI technologies are kind of like a brick thrown through the window of most developers right now. Like it definitely got their attention. And now we're looking to see like, what was the message written on the brick? <laughs> um, uh, yeah. It's really exciting. It's definitely a little unsettling. Um, uh, Here's how, how I look at it. Uh, the way developers do the same jobs they do today is changing. It doesn't mean the job's going away or something. It just means like there, there's new assistance to tackle the hard parts or the boring parts or answer questions about the parts they know less about or automating some parts of it. Like just common core developer tasks are getting streamlined today with generative AI assistance like our Q, our, our Q product. Um, but then there's this second component that is super interesting, that they're building new things. Like yeah. we talked about, they're building smart agents to help their end users do X, Y, or Z faster right. and more easily. And so developers are starting to learn about this generative AI technology and how to apply it and use bedrock and put guardrails on it and, and, and build an agent. They're, they're learning that. And then this, this other third component that's really interesting is that it's even changing who can be a developer. So uh, we're seeing new tools that like other kinds of users with like a technical background or even a business user background can like almost instantly build applications. And so the, the family is getting bigger of, you know, who's a developer, who can be a developer. And that's exciting. All those things are happening at once, Alex. It's, it's a little unsettling. It's incredibly exciting. And uh, to this, this new future that, that we're racing towards. So how do you manage the, that unsettling <laughs> world? How do you think about it? How do you try to keep it straight? Well, I, look, I, th I think a big part of all of this uh, 
in a time of change is um, being really honest of what we know we don't know, where the tools yeah. work and where they yeah. don't work, and they're getting better every week. You yeah. know, we're delighted. And having a really good connection with your community and leading from the front. You know, we are actively, you know, using these same tools like Q inside our own software engineering across Amazon and at AWS. So our engineers are learning. And um, I, I, I literally have L4, like our entry level engineers, like fresh out of school in many cases, on this floor. They're on my service team. And I watch them over a year or two, like get into these new tools and see how they could tackle new problems fearlessly. Where before they'd have to go ask somebody more senior, like an L5 or L6, hey, can you orient me to this? And then with these new tools, they could just crack in. Like, okay, I'm just going to go for it and see what I get. And then iterate and learn. And it, it changed their, uh, their learning journey. So we're going that, we're going through that, that, that transformation also. Um, another example is we have a really big Java fleet across uh, Amazon, right? We have like tens of thousands of different applications that use Java. We did a giant upgrade of our Java runtime from Java 8 to a, a latest version. And uh, it would have been on the, the order of thousands of person hours of work and we were able to radically cut that time. And then once that transformation is done, it saved us in the order of $250 million a year of operating costs because the modern runtimes are more efficient. So we're going through this learning journey too. We're trying to be super candid about what we do, do know, what we don't know, but then take all those learnings and feed it right back into the products. So tell me more about that candidness. Um, uh, well, uh, it's pretty straightforward, but we just like to show, not tell, but get hands-on with developers and show them how to do the, use the tools to do practical jobs they would do today. Uh, in this building downstairs, we have the generative AI loft that we reopened in San Francisco a month or so ago. And we have events, I think daily, pretty much daily. We have 250 events, you know, six lofts around the world. So there's pretty much something going on every day, including over the weekends. And we're down there with our developer community and our partners, like hacking together and learning the tools and trying new things and uh, seeing what works and where we can push the technology. And then really we bring all that feedback back. My team spends a lot of time working with our service teams, uh, bringing feedback back. The, the future is here, it's not evenly distributed and uh, we're happy to share like all these best practices of prompting and coaxing the best out of the tool. But the spirit is just help people work in whole new ways. Let's move to open source just in conclusion. And your open source organization has changed over the past several years. It's much more significant than it was in years past. Tell me about it. You know, Tell me about the open source organization at AWS about where it is today and where you see it going. Yeah. Um, so our open source um, uh, core teams have grown pretty significantly in the last couple of years as our open source footprint has grown. Um, active in lots of projects, open search, Valky and others, and just want to be a really good community steward. Um, we do do a lot of work out with the community. We're super worried about things like um, uh, you know, um, committer burnout, you know, like organizer burnout and keeping these communities really healthy. And uh, we're trying to make sure also internally that our service teams, when they engage in open source, they do it in a way that really puts the stewardship of the project, the community front and center. Uh, like what we don't want to do ever is like throw code in a project and walk away. We want to make meaningful contributions and a commitment over time to be part of the project and part of the community. So. Um, we have to we have to have some hard conversations internally to make sure our service teams really get that. But I think if you've seen from OpenSearch and Valky and, and PyTorch, uh, we AWS wants to be a really great uh, participant in the open source community and build a bigger ecosystem for all of us to, to benefit from. So how are you thinking of supporting maintainers, for instance? Do you want to hire maintainers? Do you want to support them through funding independently? Yeah. Uh, we. We do a mix of things to support maintainers, and I don't think we have a silver bullet to solve the broad challenge of maintainers across the ecosystem. We do have some core maintainers on our staff that work as part of our service teams, and uh, and we do provide some support for projects. Um, I'm not an open source maintainer, so really how you know how they want to adapt the tools will be sort of where 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 we go and support. How do you see then the open source group at AWS evolving with? the advent of generative AI. And there's lots of conversation right now about how do you define open source, really, you know, with, with yeah. large language models. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, first and foremost, uh, open source is not going to change because of generative AI. And the work of building open source communities and healthy projects and uh, 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 being inclusive, generative AI is not going to change any of that. And that core innovation, 
and uh, uh, distribution of technology and setting roadmaps and working as a community. That's not a generative AI thing, that's a human thing. And we need to make sure we really support that. And a lot of new capabilities are gonna flow in as tools for them to use, which is pretty exciting. Um, you know, tools and how they do the job and maybe take some of the parts that are uh, more mundane off the plate. For example, builds are automated now. Builds didn't used to be automated. So build automation is like a kind of automation. I think we'll see more examples like that. A another thing that's happening right now is there's a lot of things like flowing in claiming to be open source. Our position is pretty straightforward. We tried to stick with the original roots of open source of really be open so anyone can use it, anyone can recreate it, anyone can modify it. Um, not everyone shares that in this new uh, generative AI world, but that's our general approach. And we try to be really thoughtful and not use the terms open source if we feel like it doesn't really apply. It's great that there are things like open weights and other things. Doesn't quite match uh, what, we, what we see the spirit of open source being, but um, I think the whole community is working through this and they're, they're, they're fairly different points of view on it. And open source is going to continue to grow and it's gonna continue to need people to help with all kinds of different projects. Adam, that's pretty much the case, isn't it? So what would you say to the people out there who might be thinking about getting involved in open source or never even thought of it before? Yeah, uh, it's a community thing. So uh, you, don't, you don't have to enter open source like a core committer or the most hardcore PR or the hardest part of the project. Getting involved can start by using the project, going to community events, giving feedback, making suggestions on documentation or usability feedback. It's okay to just be part of the project and ease in and get deeper as you go and you learn more and you find your area of expertise. It's great for your career. It can, it can really expand the network of people that are working on the core of a, of a, of a project over time and uh, keep it really healthy. And your great idea might turn to the next, uh, the next big feature of these open source projects. PyTorch is looking for more uh, you know, uh, uh, community members to give feedback and participate. There's an ARM64 optimization effort if you wanna go really deep on ARM optimization that's, that's, uh, they're calling for. But broadly, I would just encourage anybody in the community to find ways to start getting plugged into open source. It's really great for the projects. It's really easy to get started. And that can be a really interesting career avenue for you. It's like chopping wood and carrying water. I hear that term a lot. Like, <laughs> you know, anyone can chop the wood, anyone can carry the water, anyone can write the documentation. And one thing I really see at the uh, open source events I go to, these people really enjoy each other's company. They really have a sense yeah. of like togetherness. And I think especially for young people who are coming out of post COVID and thinking about where their life is going and everything else, open source is just a great thing to try. Yeah. To see what it's like. Developer communities, just a lot of magic happens there. Open source communities are extraordinary. Yeah. And uh, it's really fun to, to be part of them. I can, I, can say, I can say it after doing it for decades. It's really fun to be part of them. Well, and that's why we write about it. So if you want to write about open source, visit, visit, visit us at the new stack. So okay. So and much. if you want to code in open source, come join us at the AWS ecosystem. <laughs> <laughs> great. Thank you.